And hopefully you can see my screen okay. The idea really is to give some ideas and make you think a little bit about what you're doing in terms of working with the teams you're with, uh, but also um, not to give you sort of chapter and verse on how to coach girls. Uh, maybe you, you're very experienced with them already. Maybe this is your first time out with them. Um, there's lots of stuff around there. I just want to try and give some slightly different ideas, make you think of things in maybe a slightly different way without trying to go too wild and say, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Because a lot of what we're going to be doing with uh, girls rugby is exactly the same we're going to be doing with boys rugby. I'm just going to look at some of the alternative views um, and uh, different ways to to approach approach it. Uh, so uh, just uh, my background um, in terms of coaching with uh, with girls. So uh, my first real proper experience coaching girls, I did a little bit of uh, took a little bit of touch rugby when I was uh, director of rugby at Cranley School back in. Uh, I think we did a touch rugby uh, group for about two terms, um, and then my first proper experience was when I was uh, assistant coach with the Welsh women. Uh, this is not actually a picture from the match. You can see one of the women whacking and one of the English girls in the face. I don't think that's something I would coach, of course. And then since then, I worked with the Ospreys uh, women's teams. And now I'm working with the University of Bristol women's team. Uh, but also uh, done a bit of work with broad playing girls in Bristol. So that's my experience of it. And obviously, I'm out there talking to as many coaches as possible. If there are things there that you can add in, uh, that, that would be... That would be brilliant. So I'm going to do a little bit on the differences between the age groups, but not too much because uh, I think there are more important things to to look at. Uh, some of the things which I think may be more important to focus on in terms of some of the skills you're going to be using, some thoughts around how that might look when you're building a team plan and then some of the thoughts around how one runs a team. Now, talking to lots of coaches in this area, there's no doubt that running girls teams will be different to running boys teams. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, some of them are just purely environmental and cultural, that lots of the girls are arriving at rugby without much experience or much understanding of the game, and therefore, when you are the language that you use may not be so familiar to them. Uh, also, it's not regarded as a traditional sport amongst girls. And um, there are some of the approaches. For me, one of the best things about coaching girls rugby and certainly coaching grassroots girls rugby is it is ul the ultimate game for all shapes and sizes. And it allows uh, girls who may not be able to in other sports express themselves in a sporting fashion with others and whereas in say netball and hockey um if you are um, a bit slower maybe than the other players then you sort of start to drift away from the game rugby is a great one for that so that's why i'm i've always really enjoyed coaching uh women and girls rugby and i think it is the ultimate as i say a game for all shapes and sizes now you'll notice that i've got some um I put the slide there so I can write on it. And that's what I'm going to do is to talk about the key points as I go along. Rather than come up with loads and loads of bullet points, um, I'm going to write on the screen. So hopefully you can read my writing and can see that. So if it's a game for all shapes and sizes, we've got to understand that we are going to be working with players in terms of, as they move through the ages, and we let's say there's a very rough idea of the, the skill set. We may be at under 12s having a range of skills from here to here. Under 14s, the range of skills could still be very, very low right up to here. And under 16s, we've got players who are starting for the first time and going through to there. And I think this is one of the challenges that we're going to have to think about because generally the, the boys' teams will probably be coming in and maybe here to start off with, but uh, because they have played more rugby, 
it will be more like this and you will have a, a narrower range of skills to, to work with. Now, do we need to think that this is a game of rugby or a game of girls rugby? And inevitably, that will probably cause a little bit of debate amongst some coaches. But I think that we should try and picture what the game looks like for girls at under 12s and a girls team at under 14s and a girls team at under 16s. And to recognize some of the common traits that they will have and not try to be too ambitious. Now, um, I know Wayne said that he's uh, he's been he's with under 14, so he may have been with the under 12s. But if you've got a picture of what it looks like at the start of the season, it makes it much easier to make sense of their journey to the end of the season. Um, curriculums, um, if you want to use a curriculum, curricula, you will, uh, if you've been in working around curriculum, you'll know that it is just uh, a journey for that age group. So uh, a maths curriculum doesn't mean that uh, at nine years, nine years old, you'll be doing differentiation integration. It will be the stepping stones to when, if you take A-level maths or GCSE maths, you'll be doing it. So what's the journey look like? And to a certain extent, that will depend on your players. But for under 12s, well, this is their first year as probably a separate group. Um, so what will be the basics that you'll want to have in place? And we'll talk about this in a moment, under 14s and under 16s. The, the challenge is new players arriving in to these age groups. And here, the, what you need to be thinking is when a new player comes in, what do they know about rugby? What's their rugby knowledge? And generally, it is, it's not as sophisticated as their teammates. And then um, how can we make their journey comfortable so they feel safe? Now, the thing is that if you're going to have learning and you're going to improve, you're going to have to be made uncomfortable. So new players have got to be both comfortable and uncomfortable. So how can we make that uh, comfortable with them in their journey? Well, the first thing is to help them with their expectations. And I think something which uh, I found starting to work really well this year is to identify or help them uh, together to identify the sort of mistakes they may be making in a training session. So welcome to uh, rugby. Lovely to have you here. We're going to be playing some handling games to start off with. These are the sorts of things that if you're just starting out with rugby, it's going to happen. So you're probably going to drop the ball. That doesn't matter. Absolutely doesn't matter. Don't worry about that sort of thing. As long as you are making an effort or you want to make an effort, that's brilliant. Um, or uh, don't worry, we're not going to be moving into full contact. Um, uh, if we do move into contact, it, it might be that you want to stand out. That's not a problem. So you give them permission to make mistakes. You give them permission to try so that they for, therefore they know what's coming and they're not going to feel foolish within them. Now, others, uh, other good ideas often are around things like uh, finding a buddy, someone who looks after them. This is very much uh, things which I've seen very uh, work really well with girls teams where uh, there's a lot of care for each other. And this really helps them develop this um, as a as a team thing. So I'm um, going to make them feel comfortable with expectations, make them uncomfortable because they're going to have to make mistakes to learn, but realize that that's OK because you're expecting it. And the next thing is how much progression do you think you're going to have during a season? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about blocks. And <clears throat> if this is the length of the season, let's think where we're going to be at each point in the season. So it could be that you're aiming to look at your first game, uh, looking at the first half term, you're looking at Christmas, and you're looking at March. 
what sort of things will have happened since uh, the first game and the second, uh, the half term? What sort of things are we going to have in place? Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Now, this is under 12s to under 16s. There are lots of laws involved in here. I've just cut these out of the very good RFU document, which I will link uh, in the webinar notes. Um, under 12s is like under 12s boys. This is their first year. They're only one age group. Um, under 13s, under 14s, you play under 14s laws. However, what you do do is that you check with your opposition coach uh, what level you're at, and then you can decide which elements you're going to put in or put, put out. Um, again, my experience uh, talking to coaches around this is generally this is pretty good. Uh, you may have come across one or two uh, coaches who can be a little bit difficult about that because they're trying to find an advantage. This here and the nine is going to be one of the crucial parts of your rugby because the nine pass uh, is the access to play. Absolutely it transforms the game if you have players who have got the ability not only to pass the ball, but to recognize when to pass the ball. So we're going to come back to that. Now, the interesting thing here is that this is when kicking really comes to play. Obviously, it's in 12s and 11s and 12s. Here, confidence comes into play. Um, interesting, lots of boys don't have the confidence to kick. Uh, the, the My experience with girls is uh, some have played football, so they'll be used to kicking the ball. But when it comes to a rugby ball, it's a different shape to kick. Uh, one of the top skills coaches, the New Zealand skills coach, um, Mick Byrne, said, um, if you want to improve kicking a rugby ball, kick a rugby ball. You don't you don't learn to kick the ball effectively by kicking a tennis ball or a football because it's the shape of the foot. Now, obviously, you've got to get the, the leg through the ball. But if you can use uh, rugby balls as much as possible and it's tough uh, teaching players to uh, drop kick the ball who've not been used to it. It doesn't matter. Girls or boys is always a tough, uh, a tough, tough thing to do. Right. And um, really, when we get to under 16s, it's going to look pretty much like a game of rugby. Uh, this is when you need to uh, check in with your your um, your group who you're playing against about the lifting bar. So let's have a look at uh, the skills focus. Now, you will be well aware that the new tackle laws are a big part of the season, whoever you're coaching. So my suggestions are this is, first of all, be exact. What does it exactly look like? And then um, when you are training, be positive about good practice, which we would do always, and just correct, but don't don't make a big thing about bad practice. So if a player goes too high, you'll say, well, that's a penalty this year, or that's not going to be any good this year. Change it round. Okay, um, what can we do better? What can we do better? And build the confidence in good technique. Build confidence in good technique. Now, in terms of the skills, uh, I'm going to come to contact area in a moment. Things to really look out for. Obviously, the bend at the hips makes a difference, but look for the angle of the shin. If the shin is pointing forwards and the knee is going down, you are more likely to be coming in at a better angle. And this is a challenge for all players is to be able to first of all bend at the hips, but also get the knee to be moving forward. And generally, if the knee is moving forward, the back leg is probably in this shape as well. So let's encourage players to lean their knee to the ground to get lower, to be more effective in the tackle. 
Uh, in the contact area, uh, the word that I think will make a big difference, I'm going to use it across all groups, is ball toughness. Now, it's just a different way of saying what we do in contact and after contact. Let's get that part right as much as trying to avoid contact. Now, in contact, the skill is to look after the ball. Now, um, again, it'd be interesting to see what your experience is, but my experience is that girls do carry the ball in two hands a lot. This is fantastic um, in terms of the pass, but they'll also carry the ball in two hands into contact. So you will see players running uh because it with two hands on the ball great we we want to encourage that and notice this separation here that will be that will separation will happen as they reach contact so we want them to think about ball toughness we want to look after that ball that ball's got to be in to the body looked after and then after contact we want the players to be tough in terms of great ball placement. Back to the their team. So it comes back every single time. And that's a real focus, I think, uh, that needs to be put across because they tend uh, uh, because they, because the ball is bigger. Uh, they're struggling maybe to uh, carry it with one hand and manipulate the ball. They've got to think about ways to to deal with that. Now, the scrum focus um, is, for me, at all ages, focus on helping the players get good profiles. And um, again, in girls rugby, it's amazing how many girls will play four or five different positions throughout the season, if not more. Um, and therefore, every player should learn profiles. So when I talk, when I get to training, I would say that you will be doing scrum profiles in every training session. And as you become a little bit more confident and the players get more, so it's profile before contact and after contact. So you are trying to move and move the player or just put them off balance so they can find their way back into uh, um, scrummaging. Now, the line out, this here is a is a big challenge because lifting players in the line out is very tough um and uh in, for girls because uh, they are developing at different rates uh the actual lift is is a, is a massive challenge um so again it's always worth working on the very simple jump lift even if the players can't lift they should try to learn to lift develop throwers early um certainly um if i was to say um from a university point of view if we have players arriving us how many players come to us and have just become good at throwing the ball and it's a skill which is missing out now earlier on i said nines uh i'm probably going to come back to a little bit in training nines passing uh does not improve because of training sessions at the club it improves Yes, the training sessions at the club will make the difference, will we'll, uh, start the process. It is more, it's about encouraging passing outside training. So in training, you give the players templates to help them. But if they only train and pass at the club, they will not become better at specific particularly the nine 
the nine pass, but passing. So can you find ways to encourage players to pass outside training? And um, it is um, anyone who's worked in uh, schools will know that um, in schools where rugby is, it's got a bit of a, um, uh, a, a bit of a presence you'll see the boys out there spin passing all the time whereas the girls will won't be uh, doing that sort of exercise as much it's an environmental social society type thing can you use your training sessions to give the players some passing ideas on how to practice can you encourage them to pass outside training so i think that would be a big thing i mean it goes across all levels but in particular with the girls. Now, what do you do tactically um, with under 12s? I don't think you worry about tactics at all. I just don't think it uh, makes much difference. You will do some what I would call structure in inverted commas, and that is where to stand off set piece. And once there is a ruck that you you try to have some form of line away from the 10. But under 12s, that's probably as far as you want to go. With under 14s, again, I would keep the structure very simple um, and maybe talk about the difference between slow ball and fastball and what does that look like for them uh, i'm going to come on a little bit about uh, team management and uh, tax strategy a little later on and under 16s it's only a little bit more sophisticated than that more important is to spend time on skills because uh, as i said your range of skills at every year group is going to be so vast that in order to run any sort of sophisticated structure, you need to have most of the players uh, at a certain level. So that's why I would suggest that your attack structure is very uh, limited. Should you have a kicking strategy? I think the answer is yes. Players who want to kick the ball need to know why. And uh, in simple terms, I would just say, here's a couple of scenarios. Why would you kick the ball here? And then where to kick and where to stand. The most important thing is not to reduce the access to the game to players. It's just to introduce the complexity at the level they're at. Defense strategy, under 12s again, doesn't, uh, it's not really going to matter. Under 14s, you can start to explain, I think it's, it's not, it's no bad thing to explain what happens from a rook. It's not supposed to be an R in there. I think this can come in here so the players can start to organize because part of tackling and be more effective tackling is to tackle with more than one player. So just in very simple terms, we line up um, in an ordered fashion from the side of the ruck. Now, there are lots of different names you could call them. They could be A, B, C. They could be pillars and posts. I wouldn't too much worry too much about their roles at under 14s, but I would say Let's get these players in place and then let's see if we can get some spacing um, in place and then you can build up from there. What I would suggest is that if from scrums, not from lineouts, that uh, you will have some plays. The ball obviously go from nine to ten, but these players can be very uh, simple and um, certainly uh, even at... I think even at um, higher levels, one pass plays, if you're going to have a play, are the best to use. So 10 may pass to 12 coming in on an angle. Uh, 10 may miss 12 to 13 if they've got a pass. Uh, 10 may 
dummy switch for 12 and pass to 13, or they might just pass the ball along the line. One pass plays, as I say, any time that we spend on set piece can mean we spend less time on skills. Okay, moving swiftly on, um, shape of training. I think that um, engagement is vital. Uh, we're trying to build confidence for the players. And uh, one way to do that is to have lots of contact warm-ups. So they get used to being in contact, um, away from the skills stuff, which will come in later. So um, wrestling and grappling. Uh, interesting, uh, talking to a few coaches over the last few days about um, some of the things that they say is that um, there are certainly a large subsection of their team that will only go to training if there's contact. That's what they're in the game for. So if you don't have contact, then you are losing that engagement piece. Um, I'll come to play and then come back to skills. In play, have games of rugby. Um, I think that um, depending, uh, this is my own view, is that netball or rugby netball gives uh, some players some access to the game. Uh, it, it has problems because there's forward passes and uh, players stop so you need to think about if you're going to use a version of it how quickly can we get away from forward passes because they need to work very hard on, on backwards passes if they're not played much rugby and definitely the go forward part of it is um, if you've got to stop to pass so i think rugby netball has a place uh, but a very small place and uh, most of it, you should be trying as much as possible to play games of rugby where the internal logic of rugby is maintained. And the internal logic is how rugby looks different from other games. So you score, you score going forward. So there's a try line. So we score going forward and we pass backwards. Um, that's part of the internal logic. And then there is someone in our way to stop us so um if you can depending on the levels you're at with the amount of contact you are um just lots of slices of the game make a massive difference 4v4s 4v6s 3v5s and start it off looking like the game don't just throw the ball to them because they don't get the ball thrown to them in the game there's not much kicking there's a little bit of kicking uh but Start with a 1v1 scrum, a 2v2 scrum, a little ruck, and then let them play some rugby for a little bit and then come back to it. So in terms of skills, blocks. Um, so for instance, uh, tackling in a block would be, we're just going to focus on three things and we're going to keep going. So grip might be week one. Uh, week two might be footwork. Uh, week three might be a leg drive. So we might do all three in this in the same week, but we will focus week one just on grip, week two on footwork, week work on leg, week three on weight, and then we go back, and we keep cycling through these things with a little extra more complexity, and um. Every time we're doing it, we're asking ourselves, why are we tackling? What difference does it make? Why are we tackling? And let the girls come up with the reasons why. So just to finish off then, uh, talked about focusing on blocks. Make your season, split your season up and say, right, we're going to focus here on these aspects a a and b maybe and then we'll have a look let's see where we're at with them and let's go to c and d here and then have a look and where we're at with them i think uh, the focus should be 
that all young players should be mostly on skills, but tactics are important because they show you why you're using the skills. So it's no point in doing skills on their own without an understanding on the tactics. We try as coaches to focus on the team being first. And this is where I think that you your role is to say, what do you want from the season? It doesn't mean that you're going to do everything that they say, but you want to give them some idea so you understand what they want. Because it's a sport, they're going to be playing game. What does winning look like for you? And that obviously is a more sophisticated answer than just scoring more points than the other team. It is very much based on things like improving skills. That could be wins. And uh, I know this is uh, the slightly older age group working with the University of Bristol women this year. Uh, I was working with the second team mainly uh, after Christmas. Uh, we lost all our games. We had six games. We lost all of the games. Um, and there's good reason for that. Uh, you might say we're a terrible coach, but it's more about uh, the standards we're up against. But every half time we set out, what do we need to do differently in the second half? And at the end of every single game, the girls were not disappointed that they'd not won the game. They were delighted that they'd set some targets for themselves and were very, very simple targets and they'd achieved them. And so that made the difference. What does winning look like for you? And the final question is, you ask the players, what do you want from me? How can I support you? in what we might call winning in what we might say what do you want and this is not a question which is asked once at the start of the season in a team meeting this is a question which is a constant question that you're asking them so they have got a voice in developing the whole team they haven't they aren't making every single choice in fact they're probably making a very limited menu of choices in what's going on but they are feeling quite rightly that you are there to support them and how can you support them um and i think one of the things to really finish this off is uh to say that in order to support them is that you've got to rotate them in as many different positions that they feel comfortable in so what you want means they, they may never want to play nine. They may never want to play wing. Um, and it might be that you're going to have to help them sort of see it in a different way. But they get a, if the players are used to rotating, there's more chance that they'll feel comfortable with having to play outside a position that they're, they're not used to. Because the one thing we do know, well, one of the many things we know, know is that from under 12 through to under 16 and definitely uh, beyond players change a player who was very quick at 12 could be very slow at 16 but very strong and uh, vice versa players change shape change skills change attitudes change desires so let's give them as many different chances so I've gone a bit over my, my half an hour. My idea was to uh, throw in some challenges, different ideas. This is not the only way to approach the season. These are ideas which, um, from talking to other coaches and from my own experience, uh, make a big difference. Uh, one of the things I, so I, I was going to say, actually, which is sort of like a bit of, not necessarily a bonus, is feel, be real. Uh, with your smartphone, um, it's great to take little clips of the players doing things because they may feel that they're doing something well, but the reality is that they need to do something different. So that's great in terms of um, building skills, 
but also if you can turn it around that doesn't feel right they may say it doesn't feel right but the reality is it's looking great and you are saying look you can do it you're doing this really well look how how square your hips are look how you're following through with the hands it didn't feel great it didn't feel great but it looked great and it just changes that con uh, conversation um it's fantastic to see that uh, the Yorkshire Academy are experimenting with asking girls to nominate themselves for the ACE program. And I think this is brilliant. Um, I also know that because of the way the society environment, the culture works, is lots of girls don't often feel that they are good enough to play at a slightly higher level than they are. So a lot of what I'm trying to do here is to build confidence through lots of different levels, feel versus real. If you're improving the skills, you've got little wins for them. And I think that just gives everybody a little bit more confidence. So I finished. If anyone wants to uh, jump in with any questions or uh, quiz me on some of the things, I'm more than happy to, um, to do that. There will be a re the recording. I'll send a recording out. I'll put some show notes as well and some links. So that's the end of the formal part. Feel free to jump in should you want to uh, ask any questions. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um... What I would say from uh, from my experience with uh, under fourteen girls last year is that um, obviously it's a it's a dual age group, mm. um, so that uh, to, uh, and with the nature of the girls coming into the game, um, there is a wider range of abilities as you, as you pointed out in in one of your slides, mm. um, and therefore we need to be very very realistic about what we can achieve, uh, and I think where you're where you've mentioned possible um tactics uh, in my experience i think that's probably an under 16 objective um yeah. and and this really is about um getting the girls playing getting the girls enjoying it getting some basic skills up um because if you spend time on tactics and if you spend time on forming a team um i, I think it's probably time better spent. It just, just in my experience with, with, the, with the group I've had, it's just a such a vast array of abilities that to be able to have any structure, you're naturally lent to streaming. Yeah. Um, so I'm in the Hampshire um, area. So they formed a league with like Hampshire and kind of Berkshire, sort of, you know, Reading, M4 type teams. And um, and I think forming a league is not a good move um, because, you know, coaches will naturally then start to think differently, trying to put a team together, thinking about results. And, um, and unfortunately, the girls' skill set is be behind the boys at under 14s and the range of skill sets is widely different. So, um, so, so my inclination is to just really work on the basics of um you know go forward support catch pass um in a, in a, in a, in an as enjoyable um way as possible and i would think that structure and tactics would come at the under 16 age and at that age the girls have really got their heads around the physicality and whether they really want to be involved in the game mm. absolutely and i think um the and that's why i put structure in i'm not trying to see um justify what i've done but i think you're exactly right uh, the the reason why i put structure in inverted commas is that they need to know a little bit about you've got to spread out in attack and i think that you can start to introduce if the ball's a bit slower we might do this if the ball's a bit fast we might do this and a little bit of structure and defense but uh as i said earlier on it, it just it all comes at the cost of skills and yeah. um if we, we we know and you'll know as well as anyone who's coached this is that um the the catch pass if you if you don't have three or four players who can catch pass then the rest of the team never see the ball because yeah, it just I, I, cannot I, I, it cannot move 
any further than um, a, a forward and 10. Yeah, exactly that. The, the girls' game at that age is very, very stop start. Uh, what what do I mean by that? There's, there's very little continuity. The mm. the rucks are very slow. There's no kind of it, it's it's almost uh, the girls kind of invite each other to contest at the ruck. No, <laughs> That's right. No I see you know, you know, they come in and kind of lock horns slowly like a pair of stags and then start pushing, and then the passing, <laughs> excuse me, is very lateral or going backwards. And everybody stops to receive the pass, and then starts because they because they don't have that skill to be able to pass on the go with with any kind of momentum. Um. So yeah, it's it's it, it it's it's a challenge, and that's why yeah, just focus on that, go forward, and support basics really for me this year. Yeah. So on the passing, one of the things that I've done uh, we've done this year is to um to try and understand what passing really looks like in a game of rugby and one of the things that um in a in a narrow channel often uh we find our girls pass really well uh because yep. they have an awareness and it's just, just a natural athletic ability that there's someone there they get tackled they can pop the ball off when it goes into wider channels uh the, the problem comes is this in terms of the spacing they can't get the spacing right. It doesn't feel natural for some reason to start off with, and then um, they don't. They don't want to. They they find it hard to pass. So one of the things I did with the university girls, and it's just a thought, and uh, you know, it's quite it's quite brave to do it. Is uh, there's two things we did. One is um, I just encouraged them to keep passing. Don't worry about where the defenders are. Because a lot of them think I've got a fixed defence. Just keep passing. I'm more interested in if you can pass in the ball in, in training. Just get them confident passing the ball. But the second thing is, I would say, here's nine, and they're passing to ten. Ten, so the first receiver does have to pass. This would be in a in a game of uh, training training game. Does have to pass, but they are not allowed to look where they're passing. And the thing that I found was, um, is that it's amazing how few passes get dropped. Because this player here, they sometimes communicate, but they, they've got to work really hard to try and work out where 10 is going to pass it. So they start to think, now I've only put 10, 10 9, 10, 12, because uh, we, we, that's what a battle line is. But it could be any player. So the nine passes to 10, 10 is not allowed to look where they pass. And then they've got a pass to 12. And then I use something called the food rule. Now, uh, if you, you've got kids, you will know that unscientifically, if you drop a piece of food on the floor, uh, if you pick it up within five seconds, it's OK to eat. Uh, and it's not, there's no science behind that, by the way. That's just a myth. But we have a three second rule. That means that should this player drop it, as long as they pick it up within three seconds, it's OK. And just trying to get these players to be more confident to get that spacing. And then we get this rate, what I call rate of passing along the line. Um, every time um, you play a game of uh, rugby netball, they aren't they aren't doing, which is the hard thing, which is roughly sort of facing up the pitch and then turning their hips a little bit this way to pass the ball that's a hard that's a hard skill so every time we play rugby netball we we're looking ahead and actually the difficulty in rugby is that's that's where that's our that's our vision there and if we're lucky we can see a little bit in our peripheral vision Therefore, when we pass, we've looked late to this player. So anything where we can get our players to be going forwards and passing backwards in, uh, and I don't use the word chaos anymore because I think you don't learn in chaos. You learn in slightly more difficult situations. So not chaotic, slightly more difficult. They're running forward, passing backwards, maybe with someone in front of them, maybe with someone here, but enough difficulty for them to feel i can get the pass away maybe i'll get it away four out of five times or three out of five times so just a couple of 
different things that we we brought in with uh, the older girls and these girls are new to rugby quite a lot of them to try and just get away from passing to someone that they can see so just a thought mm -hmm. i don't know if that uh, that's um and i know that i know plenty of coaches who will use a lot of rugby netball with the girls uh and they run great programs they've got girls keep coming back and it works really well for them so it is not i'm not i wouldn't throw i wouldn't say throw out netball i would just say that uh if i was doing it i would try and bring in a more, more netball but as you said wayne if the girls aren't enjoying it and it doesn't look like they'll ever enjoy it then it's for the bin because it's just not worth it Yeah, it's in, uh, interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, probably steal the the food rule. Um, it's definitely going to be a focus on that, being able to go forward and, and offload. Are, yeah. are you familiar with the the, the Pierre Vilpre stuff and how he runs his sessions? Yeah. Uh, so um, when was it? Uh, so first got introduced to this uh, stuff back in nineteen ninety eight, ninety nine. So. Um, and in terms of, um, I know they say joué, but I mean it's about um, um, it's, here's, it's here's about, the defence, here's all, the attack. Having close support, really. Yeah, the family of the ball. Yeah, so, so it looks very much like sisters. your his, his session would start looking very much like your narrow channel, and mm -hmm. they're basically looking to yeah offload create two on ones, two on ones, two on ones, and I have this constant momentum and rotation of people. Um and I think it's I think it's really, really applicable to the girls hmm. because a, a, a more a more kind of traditional um coaching message would be right, I want wits, right? I want my winger to be 15, 20, 25 meters away and I want you to get the ball to her as quickly as possible. Well they just don't have the passing skills. Hmm. They just don't have the passing skills to make Four passes and under fourteens, they sometimes playing on four full size pitches, right? Yeah. They just haven't got passing skills, so therefore it just goes laterally and backwards. So I would be very much encouraging them to have these very close, um, yeah, families they call them, don't they? Yeah. And and looking to be offload and and never let anybody to be on the ball without supporters around them. Yeah. And so he the talks girls, about things like, like early girls, support and late support. Yeah. Uh, which is a bit more sophisticated, obviously. But um, yeah, so the I, I mean, I think that that's we, we need to get the players to be comfortable in a narrow channels. So what they talk about is um, and when you hear them, I used to think they, they were saying dual. But actually, yes. they weren't saying dual. They were saying dual. That's right. Yeah. And uh, where the player's got to be confident to beat the player in front of them. Uh, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested to see what you think, Wayne. But I, I find sometimes the girls will run. First of all, they run with two hands on the ball all the time, which causes as many problems as it creates opportunities. Uh, but they don't want to beat the player in front of them. Right. And that that's a real, I think that's a real challenge because they 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 don't see that as uh, what uh, Phil Pro and his um, acolytes would call the duel. At all, they, they don't. They just think that I got to run up to play, and then I got to pass. Yeah, they stop basically, and they can't yeah, yeah. That, that and that habit of yeah, taking a couple of steps through, learn your mental take through, and then offload is um it, yeah, it's part of the the coaching skill really to try and get them get them to do that. Yeah, because you don't want them stopping, turning around because the support player then has, has overrun them typically. Yeah. So uh, not the one, not the term you'll be using with your under fourteens, but something along this. Uh, yeah, exactly that. They, yeah, they, exactly. they run in, slow down, everything slows down, and they just shovel on shit, and it just become everything becomes worse. And I think that that's a problem we have with. Uh, there's this idea that we've got to fix players, and so there's a the defence there, and the player thinks they've got to run all the way up to this player and then pass all the way back, and. Um, it's a hard thing to do, I think, in any level. But just say, let's give let's give this player on the end a problem, rather than these players. Let's just try let's try and get the ball out. And you you it, it's not necessarily just about creating width. It's just about let's keep passing the ball. Um, uh, let's um, uh, democratize. Demo let's see if I can spell it right. Democratize the game. 
give more people more decisions because otherwise uh, the game come and this is uh, you see this is under th- under thirteen boys is that nine passes to the big forward who smashes the ball up or runs all the way around or they give it to the quick runner or, and in the end everyone else is just bit players. Mm-hmm. Uh, they might uh, they might lean in on the scrum uh, or help in a ruck and anything like like you said I think that that idea about using uh, the Vilpra in channels is 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 great work because these players then get confident that they can do the dueling and the the support we don't have to call it the family of the ball we can just say look look after the ball yeah so I'll play a lot of um offload touch so you know they can take a couple of steps after the touch mm. uh, but then the person they have they offload to can't be standing still so so mm. those are the constraints and then what the girls are really good at is identifying the purpose of the training session better than boys and yeah. they'll ask you questions and um and, and, and it's really enjoyable and i've seen a lot of success doing doing that type of exercise just to get that continuous momentum going yeah how the, the the challenge then of the skill of you've been able to pass three or four meters flat while you're running is 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 clearly something we can have to work on. But the the first principles of going forward and support, I think we can get there. Yeah. Well, if I go back to this slide here, um, and this point here, is that um. Touches on the ball in training will make a difference. And it, it you can start to encourage good habits. Uh, the players who go away from training and then pass the ball at any opportunity will be the ones who come back the better players. It would be lovely to say that um, we've improved passing just with the uh, every, because we've had 90 minutes with the girls every week for the last 20 weeks and uh, their passing has individually improved immensely because of that. And they won't be the case. It will be the case because they will have been inspired, encouraged um, by that to go off and try it themselves. Yeah, um, the, the, the half, the, at the start of every summer, so I've done under 16 boys from under eight as well. So, mm. um, so I've sort of taken those all the way through. Yeah. And the start of every summer, I send out a clip of the uh, of the half ball, you know, um, training with one of those rhino mm-hmm. half balls, the rebound balls. That that's you're absolutely right. That's the only way they're going to do it. That's the only way they're going to get there. For the ones who are serious and keen. Yeah, but I mean that's uh, I mean our role in that, and uh, the fact that you're sending that out makes well, makes is part of the key difference. I mean, if you're in coaching, you don't care about the players, you know you you're not really you shouldn't be in coaching but most coaches do care about the players it's then how they then help that care come through and you know what do you want from me often gets them so when you then say uh go back to them and say um tr- tr- you know try this out they'll be more receptive and you know the fact that you're doing those sorts of things m- makes a massive difference because Let's say you've got 20 players in there. What percentage do you think will actually go and do it? Um, I'm guessing it'll be a quarter of them if you're if you're lucky, but that's Agreed. quarter better than zero. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'd be it'd be brilliant if every single but they don't, they've got they've got lots of other things, and so they should be, they should be doing other things. Uh but those players who want to will they'll come back and uh, that'll be fantastic. And uh, yeah, I certainly saw it. One of the girls this year, again, using Bristol girls as a uh, Bristol girls as an example. Uh, one of the girls came back and her left hand passing was amazing. So the head coach said, cool, Chloe, your, your, your passing has been brilliant. What, what's happening? He said, my brother watched me play, said I was crap at passing. So we spent the whole summer passing to each other off my left hand. Well, yeah, not everyone's got a brother who says they're crap and then they become determined. But that, that that's going to be the difference uh, for some of these players. Um, and for others, we're just giving them uh, possibilities. 
Yeah, agreed. I, I tried that method um, with my daughter. So my daughter's 13, my son's 16. Um, but if my son tries to tell her anything, she just, yeah, she's not having any of it. <laughs> so that didn't yeah. work out. Maybe in a few years' time. Yeah, well, uh, they are, you, they are uh, I think, well, uh, Chloe must be 21, 22. So I think that was probably all right. But uh, yeah, siblings don't always listen to each other. Well, very rarely. My my kids uh, thought like uh, anything. Uh, now they're, they're best mates. But uh, yeah, if one of them gave anyone, the other one any advice, it would be more like a punch up than anything, <laughs> anything else. <laughs> well wait I mean, if, you, if it does work then you found some uh, magic dust that we need to know about Dan hi Richard um, could you just go back to that with the, the passing from nine yeah um, I, I, I do see it as a really important part of the game um, mm. but I, I find that uh, we've got a couple who can pass who have then become the nines and then nobody else wants to go near it. Do you have any suggestions of how to how to incorporate it, or how to find other people to play nines? Or okay, so um, the I mean, obviously, there's a uh, there's a motivation piece in there, which uh, you'll know your players better than I will. But something we did uh, with the the bears under sixty, under 15, 14s, and under fifteens is every time we played a training game. Um, let's say I don't know how many players you've got to train, but let's say you're playing eight an eight v eight. Um, one of the things to do is to say in each team, right? Um, nominate a nine, and that player has got to play nine for the next three four minutes, and then you rotate. So you rotate them so they. They, they almost it's not they can't get out of it but everyone plays nine and i mean in in the in the game itself it's much better if you've got lots of players who can pass the ball away from the base of the rook so that's that's one thing so nominate a nine in uh, in games so you play for two minutes with uh player a two minutes with player b two minutes and actually another thing we did was nominated uh two first receivers so we bibbed up two first receivers so it again democratized the game so there were more players having to take the ball at first receiver uh, and do that and the second thing is um is the players uh, often don't want to do something because they're not confident now and this is this is across um any gender any age um the research into um, skateboarding says that um kids would go down see someone doing a trick but they would never do the trick in front of anyone until they practiced it a lot away from the skateboard part. And then they would bring it back in. So that's an example of you, you're confident to do it in front of people when you're prepared. Um, so the thing that um, I'm just trying to think, it must be on the site somewhere, is that I, I get the players um, in a thing called, um, the exercise is called get out of here. It's on the site somewhere, but um, you have three seconds. Basically, it's um, it's an exercise where you've got three seconds to clear the ball from a breakdown. So the first person who gets there has got to clear the ball within three seconds. But they've got to clear the ball in a certain way. And that means that when they reach the, here's the ball. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to illustrate this very well. When they arrive at the ball, they've got to sit. And that means they've got to sit with feet either side of the ball. They sit feet either side of the ball. That means they're relatively balanced. And then they've got to pass the ball away. And to pass the ball away, they've got to shoot their hands towards the pass. If their hands don't face where they've passed the ball and they haven't sat, then their group are told to get out of here. And they are, they're out of the exercise for about 30 seconds and then they come back in. So you you may or may not use the sort of get out of here type way of doing it. But the key thing here is that they've got to have confidence that when they reach the ball, they need to sit. That means they're balanced either side and then they shoot their hands to where the pass, where the ball's going to go. Now, that's not the only way to pass the ball at nine, but it starts them on the process of being able to pass the ball effectively because 
tends to be the case that where your hands and certainly your fingers when you shoot i'm not sure if you can see me on the screen if you shoot you've got to really fire the hands towards where you're going to go and it just starts that process of moving the ball uh, quickly away from the scrum now more sophisticated players will start to put their hands on the ball in a different way they'll make balance they may uh, twist their hands over they may do things like that and that just gives them every player can sit at the ball every player can shoot their hands and therefore more players will suddenly find oh yeah i can do that and then um because they've been nominated to nine they'll be used to uh so here's here they are standing here and a breakdown happens here well they've got to get there which is one of the things that nines often don't do if they're not experienced. They don't get to every breakdown and then they've got to sit, shoot. And that's what you're saying. Uh, player A, um, Chloe, for one of a better name, Chloe, what are you going to do? Sit, shoot, sit, shoot, sit, shoot, sit, shoot. I well, don't say it too often, too quickly. If you have a glass of wine, you might be saying something else. But what we have here is them in, in that situation. Right, so I've rambled there. Uh, so how does that sound, which is, is something uh, which would be useful, a, a different things you might want to comment on? sounds useful. Um, it's actually quite important for us because uh, we end up playing uh, a lot of sevens. Mm -hmm. And so we, we sort of lose that structure of having a nine chasing. So everyone has to be able to play the ball away. Yeah. Um, but the uh, once you've got one or two players who can pass they either sort of fall into that role mm. or the others sort of want them to take that role because, yeah, like you say, that confidence. So I was just, I was just thinking about ways we can get that confidence going, really. Yeah, I think uh, the first thing is to give them some very simple ways to pass, uh, base pass. Um, and, I mean, it's quite, um, it's quite, uh, the, the actual scrum half pass is not an easy pass to do. Um, and certainly when I've done, uh, when I do courses, uh, coaching the coaches, and you get um, coaches who are not used to it passing, you see all sorts of different methods which are not that effective because they haven't done it before. The sit, the shoot just starts a process even if they don't end up passing away but yeah which you're quite right in sevens you want to have as many players who are able to do it uh as possible i mean you could nominate two nines I and mean, we've done that before um because that that's that's more 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 effective but it certainly it focuses their mind for that particular game that they've got to be doing that for that next two minutes thanks Okay, so stick around if anyone's got any more questions. Uh, the other thing is, uh, obviously, anytime uh, email me, uh, drop me a line. I'm really always happy to chat. Uh, Wayne, that's fantastic that you've shared what you've shared on that. That's just all these things add um, flavor and to the way that we should approach things. And there's no, there's no absolutes. I mean, it's got to be safe, but there's no absolutes in the way that we coach it. And it's got to suit the team and your style at the time so that that was great well, both yeah, of you. Ha ha happy to collaborate further I, i've got to shoot guys because the family are waiting for me for dinner but um, <laughs> right, okay. great, great, great to chat tapas no doubt when yeah yeah cheers all right okay thanks very much well um i'm going to um close off anyone else wants to ask questions please jump in otherwise um thank you very much for coming along Dan, just one other thing. Yeah. Do you have any anything to do? Have, yeah, any suggestions in terms of um, strength work or ways to to make strength work? It, there's a, a bit of a resistance towards that sort of I don't know I don't want to say traditional, but um, yeah, the, the girls don't want to go and do the sort of pumping iron sort of way that the boys do, and I'm I'm trying to find ways to keep it fun, interesting, and and but still um ticking all the boxes does that sound right what what age group are you with <laughs> um i am doing <laughs> i've got everybody um right, okay i've got 30 girls 
um, at uh, I'm in Berlin and in Germany we're doing it um, under 15s and uh, sort of senior girls yeah. so I've got across the ages really um well um first of all I'm I'm not a strength and conditioning expert Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I've got a few things which I can uh, add in. And uh, we'll, the thing is, that, um, what I will do is that um, if you can just drop me an email. Yeah. So uh, I've, well, I used, uh, you've got the link, so you've got my email. Uh, and I will um, I will connect you with somebody who can give a, maybe a, a more of an answer. So the, the, you're quite right. The first of all, the first of all is that, uh, fitness, and I, I've said this on the other ones, is that um, you've got to, to a certain extent, you've got to downplay, but upgrade fitness. So if if they come to sessions and you say, right, this session is going to be about fitness, you're going to lose a whole bunch of people who will say, I haven't come for fitness, I've come for enjoyment, I've come from this. But actually, uh, the feedback from a lots of girls is that they like the fact they're going to get fitter. So what I say is you got to, the, the upgrade is that we're going to do some things which are going to make us fitter, um, but aren't going to be too, uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, too onerous. Um, so sure. lots of body, body weight stuff is really good. The grappling, the wrestling, um, the, the, um, the sort of modified press-ups, sit-ups, that sort of thing. But within within the games or as little breakouts from the games, things like that. And then um, well, the other thing is it, um, it kids of that age are like sheep. If, if somebody is going off to do something, the others want to know, <laughs> Why are they doing it, and what, 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 why can't they? Why, when, when can they get involved? So, I think that if you can find a couple of advocates for it, then that's a, that's another way. But that's just a couple of things that I would have thought. But to say I'm not a strength and conditioning expert, I know enough about it to ask somebody else, and uh, I know what's okay. safe. So, drop me an email, and I will try and connect you with somebody to think about that. And then when they're giving you the answer, I'm going to write it up. Excellent. That's great. That's okay. And um, yeah, and yeah, great. Great is also a really good question as well. Yeah, that's made me think about uh, a bit more about that. Okay, um, Patrick. Unless you've got anything to say, ask. Then I will. Uh... No, just to say thank you. It's been uh, informative. So yeah, lots of things to consider and build in. Yeah, well, you're doing under twelves, aren't you? So that's um, that would this would be their first year away as as a team themselves. Yeah, so I've come up with my daughter plays in the under twelves now, um, but I've been coaching her through the minis mixed for right. the last sort of five years or so. Right. Um, yeah, so it's it's a different focus to having the boys in there. Um, and, well, and where are you based? All the numbers. I'm in Surrey, so um, near Epsom. Surrey, all right. Epsom. Oh, Sutton Epsom Rugby Club. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, yeah. that's massive, isn't it? The club. Yeah. Uh it, it's pretty big, but girls-wise, it's um, it's a struggle at under twelves and all under right, teens okay. at the moment. So you know, I've only got four. So there's a big push to try and get the numbers up. But then, like you said, on the the skills. You know, you, you've got some, you know, the four who've been playing for three, four, five years and the, the new girls coming in, you know, it's it's trying to to bring their skills up to that level without, you know, it affecting the confidence and that sort of thing. No, yeah, well, uh, I mean, I'm going to say positively, great challenge. Yeah, that's how I have to look at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just, um, yeah, keep in touch. Anything I can do to... Uh, if you've got any questions around that or uh, as you're going along, you see, right, how do I do this? And yeah, please, please drop me a line and uh, whatever I can do to support it, I can, I'll try. All right, cool. All right. Okay. Uh, have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Cheers. Bye.